Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our quarter one mediation day symposium uh, that is running uh, this morning into the evening. We apologize for the slight delay and um, we shall start uh, right away with the national anthem. Oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity. Peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. So, um, once again, um, good morning, everybody, and uh, we appreciate you coming in. Uh, our morning uh, session uh, today, as we kick off the symposium, we'll be looking at the way forward for education in uh, Kenya and Africa. Uh, we shall have two speakers this morning. Uh, we shall have um, Mediator Christina. Ms. Mediator Christina is the team leader at uh, Jesilo Consultancy. She has been in the education sector for more than 25 years. And uh, she'll be giving us some commentaries uh, on the design of the school-based education ecosystem and later on, on uh, effective uh, schools. Uh, we also have with us uh, Charles Kibika, who is the Chief Innovation and Product Officer at, uh, at uh, Longhorn Publishers. Uh, Charles will be able to, uh, to, to take us through uh, understanding the disruption in, in education at this uh, particular time. Uh, so, very welcome and opportunity for Christina to be able to say hello um, to uh, to the participants. Christina, please say hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's a delight to be here today. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Um, Charles, please yeah, say good morning. hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, looking forward to our discussion. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I'll give the opportunity to Christina to be able to take us through the first commentary uh, where she will be helping us understand um, the issues in education. Christina Karibusana. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, to begin with, I'll say that uh, everyone in this forum, mediators, professionals in every field, has been to school or is in school. So in one way or another, we, are all, we have a relationship in the school system or the education system in this country. Uh, I want to begin by giving a story here. In a school I was, where students had to go to fetch water from a crocodile infested river every evening. And this water was to be used for, uh, by them to wash clothes, to clean, and even to, 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 to take a shower. So the teacher on duty would always accompany the students to the river to make sure that there is order. So they would fetch water and come back. And the crocodiles used to appear uh, uh, at the banks of the river by in the evening, from evening toward uh, throughout the night till morning. So the students will go fetch water, come back, and of course life goes on. Now, as mediators, I would ask, I would pose a question: Do you think the areas which could potentially lead to a dispute? in such a scenario, because this is a, a, a real scenario. Well, the education system in, the, in, in this country is basically meant to, to, to meet the national goals of education. 
And of course, that leads to national unity. And as mediators, really, this is our goal, to have a nation that is united and of course living harmoniously. Now, the education environment, which involves schools, colleges, universities, non-formal education, involves interactions and interrelationships of all the aspects of the school. And uh, you find that uh, in this school system, of course, even in the colleges, we have the interactions of two main programs as set out by the government. That is the curriculum and the co-curriculum. The curriculum is that one, is a, is a program that is based on purely academics. And the co-curricula is based on uh, non-academics, like games and sports and clubs, but they enhance the curriculum or the academics. They, they support because they help students to refresh and energize so that they are able to concentrate more and absorb more uh, in the academics because it's really a mental activity, it's a cognitive activity. Therefore, with these two in the, in the, in the, in the education system being designed to assist the, the, the implementers of the curriculum to meet the national goals, then you find that uh, 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 a lot goes on within the institutions. Now, an education system or a school, a college, a university involves uh, uh, a lot of human, human interaction. And in particular, here in this case, we have the students, the teachers, the parents, the community around, the stakeholders, just to mention a few. And each one of us, every one of us here is part of it in one way or another. Therefore, a harmonious interaction of these, uh, uh, these people and of course, interaction with the curriculum and the co-curriculum is very important and is paramount to the achievement of the objectives that have been set. Now, uh, policy frameworks have been put by the government to ensure, or rather to give a, a roadmap to uh, how this can be implemented seamlessly. And this is what happens in the school systems. So once this is done, obviously, the end result is a person who is equipped with knowledge, the relevant knowledge, the relevant skills, and the relevant attitudes to enable this person to live in harmony with other people in the society. That is basically the envisioning, the, the vision of, of, of the education sector in whichever area, whether technical, IT, art, or sciences. Now, looking at that, or the, rather thinking about that, what really would, uh, what is one aspect that would lead uh, the education system or environment not to get to achieve those goals? And as mediators and professionals, stakeholders within the sector, uh, we come in to make things easier or to assist by resolving conflicts which may arise because conflict resolution in the school system, in the education sector has been one area that has always been swept under the carpet. So that uh, the, so the resolution of conflicts in this sector has not been critically addressed. And here we are currently with the COVID-19 situation or challenge it is leading us now to rethink. Actually, I'd say it is making us to unlearn and relearn because we need to look at now other areas or other ways or approaches which are going to lead us or methods which are going to help us to achieve these goals. Of course, in a case or a situation of harmony, peace, 
within the institution. So I, 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 I ask, I again pose a question, mediators, as mediators, how do we come in and contribute to creation of a harmonious ecosystem within the school system? And uh, I, I rest my case at that point, and back to you, Sarah. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for just being able to uh, to share with us uh, some insights about how the school system is and asking us as uh, mediators, what, what is it that we can be able to do to ensure that the school uh, system is able to function optimally, given that there's uh, a lot of things that go on within the school sector that are actually uh, potential areas of conflict. Um, we will be moving on uh, to our next uh, speaker, uh, Charles. Uh, Charles is going to be looking at uh, how the COVID-19 has caused a disruption in the education sector and uh, discussing what could be the way forward. Uh, what are the changes? What, are, what, what is likely to just come up as a result of this? So um, Charles, uh, thank you very much and you're Welcome to go on. Just uh, yes, you're muted. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and good morning again to everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take you through what's what's been happening the last uh, few months um, and what what has happened to the education sector and. Um, what, what does this future look like? So before I begin, um, I'll just maybe remind everyone in the room what, what education looked like uh, before COVID-19 happened. Um, and this is a case across, across the world um, with, many, uh, with many countries. Uh, we're not an exception. Uh, so this, of course, being a global pandemic, it's affected education. In a, in a very similar fashion across the world. Um, so pre-COVID um, ed education, I would say, was very, uh, those, those are focused on this kind of classroom environment um, where learners are expected to, to attend. And uh, this classroom environment um, uh, was kind of like, controlled by certain uh, stakeholders. So let's say with schools, uh, with teachers, there's a very physical aspect to, to this classroom environment. And learners are expected to follow a certain guideline as provided by, by their teachers. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, we acknowledge that very many the very many types of curriculum uh, or curriculars. And uh, I'll give a few examples. Of course, now with Kenya, we are transitioning from 844 to CBC. Uh, there's a presence of also international based uh, curricula, um, as well as um, homeschooling based curricula. Um, as you're aware, the there's a growing kind of um, homeschooling uh, uh, community uh, where parents kind of uh, uh, crafted their own curriculum to, to teach their kids while at home. And um, one of the things we also acknowledged in pre-COVID era was that um, in a way, education has been commercialized. Uh, if you look at it from the, let's say, put immediately after independence, um, it was mostly textbook style uh, learning and, and a bit of, um, of course, hands-on. But back then, the moment you had your papers, uh, it was guaranteed that you'd get a job. So 
over the years, what happened was uh, a lot more people were getting degrees and the number of opportunities were reducing. So now the job sector started becoming very niche or specialist where you needed to have a certain level of uh, skill or a certain level of exposure to certain work environments. So, and, and back then, um, there was a lot of emphasis on public schooling and the infrastructure in public schooling was set up in a way that um, it, it worked really well. So the adoption of now private schooling came up where I think um, one of the things society was made to to believe <coughs> one of the things society was made to believe was that if you paid premium for education uh, chances are that you would get um, higher chances to to have an opportunity to to work and uh, you saw we saw certain um, a group of uh, let's say private schools now start to introduce uh, blended curriculum or blended learning uh, or even incorporate um, international curricula so um of course but of course the majority of the population um was relying or is relying on public schooling which which uh, i would consider is is the norm for a lot of people in kenya so COVID happened and of course schools uh, closed and uh, a lot of uncertainty was brought in. Um, so for instance, with majority of the population being in public schools meant that um, there was no way for teachers to continue uh, uh, teaching their, their learners. There's no way for learners to continue with the the education uh, at home and adding other factors such as um, uh, a lot of parents also are facing uncertainty with their jobs um, this now threatened the whole basis of how do we continue uh, education so a lot of attention was diverted to use of technology to, to enhance or continue technology, uh, learning rather. And we saw a very high adoption of, uh, of uh, technology-based technology learning. And uh, this was now through various um, uh, solutions like e-learning or, or virtual learning. And one of the challenges we immediately um, received as feedback was that hey we we can't afford internet um so as long as we, we we partnered with a few um uh, telcos um and we are currently running a campaign where we are providing um free a daily bundle for free um that's limited to 100 mbs where that can give an opportunity for learners to continue using uh, some of our solutions and uh, not face these barriers uh, of access to internet. However, that doesn't entirely solve um, for the problem. And uh, we also saw a number of other challenges. Um, with virtual learning, uh, just like we are today here virtually, um, we saw that a lot of learners were struggling to adopt this whole concept of virtual presence or virtual environment. Remember, after being so used to that whole classroom environment where your, your physical presence um, was, was, acknowledged, was acknowledged, that uh, having kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction with other learners and teachers um, all that has been lost with virtualized um, uh, learning environments. And we've seen how learners are struggling to get used to it. We've seen how learners are struggling to pay attention. Uh, also, it's difficult for teachers to be able to know who's really paying attention and who's struggling. 
as opposed to a classroom environment where it's very easy to notice um, somebody who's a learner who's being distracted or somebody who is doing very well or not doing very well. Um, and that now, of course, brings about uh, how do we enhance technology to, to bring that classroom and environment as much as possible. Um, I would say at the end of the day, nothing beats that classroom environment. Uh, however, with the, with the ability, the technological ability that we have, um, it's, it's the best option that we have right now for learners to be able to continue uh, learning. So um, the, also the other challenge is that um, with, with technology, it, it brings about a certain level of, um, I would say, fatigue with virtual learning. I'm sure all, all of us here have experienced a case where uh, you've been in very long Zoom calls and it gets quite tiring uh, as an adult. And you can imagine what that is like for young children. Um, where sometimes you're expecting them to stay for long hours um, um, in, a, in a virtual Zoom class and they struggle a lot. So we've observed a lot of schools have now started encouraging parents to take part in that learning process. And um, the parents have now also become uh, assistant teachers, uh, almost by force, because uh, even if you you give a, a, a learner a, a Zoom call to attend, uh, most parents, if your parents in the room, uh, you've had to sit down with the learner and ensure that they're actually paying attention. You've had to assist the teacher, the virtual teacher. Um, in making sure that the learner is uh, following the instructions. Um, and you can imagine with parents who are also working, um, uh, how many hours do you dedicate to, to work? How many hours do you dedicate to, to becoming that assistant teacher? Uh, and even more challenging for cases where both parents are expected to be working or in a very intense work environment. Uh, we've also gotten um, or heard of examples where um, households with the, uh, who have, uh, let's say, house helps, they're also assisting. So, you know, you can see how it's, it's really disrupting this entire process. But the fact is, um, with virtual learning, there are fewer number of hours that the learners are engaging. Uh, just because of now these other factors that uh, that are coming into place. Um, so what's happening right now in, in terms of, uh, I would say from a policy making point of view, um, a lot of stakeholders are, are unsure about when schools will open, of course, following the guidelines of uh, WHO. Um, it's very, it's very tricky. Uh, it's also very, it can also be very confusing to a lot of people um, uh, in terms of when, in terms of planning, when, when, when do they think schools will open? Um, and it's being dealt with each country on its own case. So you can imagine um, the kind of confusion where, let's say, the Kenyan government is insisting, hey. Uh, we are still going to do exams at the end of the year. Um, but at the same time, the government is um, unsure about when schools will open or reopen with obvious reasons. And even if schools, it's announced that schools are open, uh, what, what is the criteria um, for opening schools? What happens to boarding schools? What happens to the guidelines on social distancing? Um, I, I think one of the statements that the WHO uh, put out sometime, I think last week or the week before, they mentioned that the COVID-19 virus um, is uh, here to stay for a long time. 
and the fact that there are a lot of things that will that will change forever going forward the the nature of the virus is that um, it's very difficult to to contain uh, almost like the the flu virus and uh, it's up to us as as citizens or global citizens um, or, and in, individuals to follow these guidelines so try and imagine what that looks like in an era where schools have opened um, what happens to public schooling where there's a clear in terms of teacher to student ratio is overwhelming um, uh, unlike the, the the global recommendations um, on that ratio so an example is let's say most private schools would have a ratio of let's say one to twenty uh, one teacher to twenty learners uh, we know for a fact that with public schools is it's a lot higher so how do they how do they contain the learners to ensure that things like social distancing are still being followed um, and especially with the younger learners um, it's very difficult to tell them hey don't touch your friend uh, don't touch this surface uh, try and um, try and uh, follow these guidelines you know they don't understand all of that so you can imagine all of these um, factors being able to disrupt continue disrupting parents and the question is how do we how do we uh, how do we evolve this traditional classroom environment to now use of technology. Um, and in cases now where we can imagine a future where schools now will reopen, how does technology continue to play a part? Um, how does now the, the style of teaching change? Also, if you look at now with the, the roles of, of parents and other stakeholders, um, parents will have to be involved a lot more. Uh, one of the things we are expecting is that uh, learners will, will probably be in school for a lot less number of hours uh, compared to pre-COVID where they're expected to be in school, let's say from eight to late afternoon. Um, this also impacts the whole eight to five work environment. Uh, what happens when uh, as, as, as working communities or working class communities, uh, we've now gotten so used to working from home and uh, whenever it is that we'll be told, okay, uh, you can now go back to your offices. It won't be the same. It's not just, uh, it won't be as easy as just waking up and saying, hey, I'm going to the office. We've already changed our habits in the last three months to to kind of blend work and and home environment um, and that also impacts the way education will will change uh, after covid i would say um, there are also discussions around um, how curriculum design will change um, and and uh, we're expecting that there'll be drastic changes to now your, your traditional curriculum to now uh, post-COVID um, adopted uh, curriculum. What happens to, let's say, the, the scope of content that learners are expected to, to consume? What happens to the role of technology uh, post-COVID? What happens to even how teachers are, uh, are teaching? You know, it also changes from, like I mentioned before, that. The, the whole classroom environment has been completely disrupted. Um, so we are also part of now um, uh, policy making in terms of being able to participate in in policy making uh, with the government, of course, and seeing how we can we can come up with a solution as stakeholders to be able to guide learning institutions to be able to guide teachers, parents, and learners on how a post-COVID era will, will look like. And I would say it's a very difficult process. Um, there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of disagreements uh, i would say everyone has an opinion on how things should happen and uh, some some opinions are very uh, are, are voiced in a very strong manner uh, and uh, uh, for the people who are not able to voice <laughs> the 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 opinions in that nature they, they seem to be drowning in 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 the in the the people who are who are loudest so um of course now with the, the the role of mediation is also now key in this kind of environment where you can imagine a lot of confusion a lot of uh, everyone wants things to be done their way um and it's i would say it's a very trying it's a very trying um uh, process a very challenging process so uh, i think the fact is that um we are mostly we're mostly unsure about the future of education in post covid we don't know what exactly it will be like but one of the things or one of the approaches we we are sure about is that uh with with the possible solutions we have in place you'll only know if it's going to work or not if you try that iterative process will be very key so it will be very important for different stakeholders including learners to be patient with this iterative process um i would be very doubtful of somebody who says hey this is going to work when it's not been tried and tested uh we're also watching very uh, closely at uh, how how government will also approach this um with a lot of leniency and and factoring in or consider or a lot of leniency and consideration it's it's very hard to it would be very difficult to let's say follow orders that may work or not work um so we're expecting a duration where we'll also have to adjust to what the future of education will look like and now through this iterative process uh, where various stakeholders will be expected to try certain solutions in piecemeal process um or, or whatever process that will have been agreed upon uh, it'll also take a while you can imagine as parents how do you adjust having worked from home for the last 3 months and uh, having taught at home for the last 3 months where you're transitioning to being expected to go back to the office being expected to to take your your uh, your child to work uh, to 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 school so it's going to take some time to obviously adjust and and uh, figure out how all of this is going to work um i've seen a comment from wagari uh, about the psychological impact of this uncertainty uh, that's a very important uh, point um i can give an example of uh, um um i was telling wagari the other day my my son is convinced he's not going back to school so you can imagine that when schools open uh, we start negotiating with him okay uh you need to go back to school for certain reasons you know they've already gotten used to this environment for the last 3 months and undoing that or changing that also has a certain impact uh, psychologically and not just with the with the children but also even with us as a as a adults um how does learning continue even for us as adults in the midst of uh Uh, this virtual environment where it seems like there's a lot more work there's a lot more uh, intensity in our day to day activities um so i think it will be also keen for uh, there's a lot of concern about like mental health at the moment uh, where we, all of us are in this confined environment confined space um and that also has an impact a lot of people are experiencing a lot of people are experiencing cabin fever kind of effect 
Um, yeah, one of the other things I wanted to mention was um, there's there's a lot of concern about um, the role of uh, I would say the role of the internet. It's being seen now as a as a basic need. Actually, a lot of people already consider it as a basic need. Uh, right now, as each one of us is in our homes, uh, probably having breakfast, what can you imagine a life with COVID in, in, in our environment with no internet? The internet has enabled a lot of us to continue working, a lot of learners to continue learning, um, students to continue learning. And we're coming from uh, an environment where internet previously was seen as a nice to have for most households. Now it's been considered a must have. And that's a very profound thing to, to, to acknowledge. Uh, I can tell you for a fact, in, in my household, if there's no internet, there will be no peace. So already you can see how the the value of internet access has has gone up with the with the this new new life uh, with with this new normal as they call it. Now, how does the government and other stakeholders how do they ensure that um, there's accessibility of internet as a basic need? How do they ensure that there's um affordable internet uh, we read about countries uh, let's say in south korea where they have one of the fastest uh, internet speeds in the world so very cheap uh, for even less than what we typically pay for a zuku or safari fiber internet connection how do we get to that level where um, that access is used is, is is made a lot more cheaper and available for majority of the population and unfortunately for a lot of learners or a lot of households in kenya uh, internet access will continue to be seen as a nice to have as a luxury and that obviously impacts how education continues both at home and at school after after COVID, um, it's it's a very it's a very touchy kind of uh, sensitive uh, topic, but um, we know for a fact that the role of technology is is uh, is a lot more is is very key as we go forward. We can't imagine uh, how our lives will become without technology. Um, and we can't ignore the fact that it has become a very crucial component of our ability to continue working or to continue going about with our various activities virtually, uh, including teaching our children uh, or them being able to learn. Um, and that's a global problem that is being faced across very many countries right now. Uh, for your typical Kenyan household that is not able to afford uh, internet, um, sadly, most of these students or learners are, are at home not doing anything or being, or rather not learning. They may be doing a few, uh, let's say, house chores here and there, but there's no, there's very little learning that is happening unless the parents go out of their way to actually teach the children. So it's it's a very, we're, we're in very difficult times. And um, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the things that will take, uh, that'll take a while for everyone to adjust to. Uh, one of the things I've been reading about um, in, in my spare time was uh, the impact of, um, World War One, World War Two, in in typical households um, in various countries, it took very many years before um, education systems were were continued in in various countries. It took very many years 
before uh, employment rates went back up uh, or businesses became established. And well, I'm not trying to compare the same, but I'm just saying that this COVID-19 era will have a very, very big impact to, to the future of the world with, with in very many sectors um, and education included. Um, so just to now um, start concluding, I think the role of mediation will be very key with being able to find solutions to, to a lot of uncertainty, being able to bring heads, bring minds together to come up with solutions, being able to resolve um, conflicts and disagreements in a very amicable and uh, mature way. And even uh, to the extent of uh, being able to acknowledge that it is, it is a must have, um, mediation process is a must have in terms of uh, being able to come up with a solution to this, to this uncertain future that we are talking about. If, uh, if you're expecting various policy makers and stakeholders to come up with solutions, then it would be very immature of them to not expect conflict. It will be very immature of them to not expect disagreements. Um, and um, that's why now the, the role of mediators is now even more key than any other time previously in history. Um, yeah, so I think um, I've, I've, I think I've, I've tried to cover as much as possible uh, how what was education like pre-COVID? What has been happening in this current uh, COVID situation, and what what the future will most likely look like? And um, and just to give you an idea of how the the role of mediation will be very important as we try and figure out solutions uh, for our future. Yeah, thank you. Um, wow, uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles, for uh, a very interesting and engaging uh, presentation. I felt like uh, jumping in many, 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 many times <laughs> during the presentation. Um, uh, really appreciate your input and uh, yeah, just the insight that uh, you have given us. Uh, about you know how things have changed and uh, and really highlighting the role of uh, mediation uh, as as a way of uh, of being able to 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 make things happen going forward in in education um, i probably will let uh, um, Christina, come back with the, the commentary that talks about the seven habits of uh, uh, conflict competent schools. But maybe just before we go into that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I had you mention anything about, you know, the negative impact of, uh, of technology and, 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 and all that. And, and probably you can just have, you know, uh, a minute or so to comment about that before we have uh, uh, Christina coming back with her commentary. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah. So, I, uh, well, actually, one of the one of the negative impacts I mentioned um, was uh, there's there's a lot of uh, technology fatigue um, with the and it's across the board, even as a as adults and also with with the younger uh, generation of children, uh, this fatigue presents itself in various forms. Where, because of the the nature in which we are expected to continue working or continue learning, we are spending a lot more time in front of screens. Yeah, we are spending a lot more time consuming this digital content, and less time resting our minds 
off of that, uh, off of these uh, platforms or, or devices. Uh, I would say particularly with learners, um, the technology brings about a lot of uh, distractions, um, especially with the fact that learners are engaging through computers or tablet devices or phones. Uh, unlike in a classroom environment where certain, a lot of things are controlled very well by the teacher. Uh, with technology, the, we have to ensure that, let's say, when you've opened a, uh, let's say a platform for your, your child to learn, they don't open something else. What happens when they click on an ad? What happens when they click on a, they open another application? So there's a lot of distraction. Uh, of course, this is being presented by, uh, or, or motivated by excitement by the learner or by the child to want to explore what they do not know. And that's that's typical for them to do that. Now, how do, how do the creators of this technology um, bring about an environment where it's, it's, uh, it's child safe, uh, where there are certain uh, protection measures that are being put in place to technology to ensure that they're not being exposed to harmful um, content and also at the same time, they're, they're still not spending uh, too much time uh, being exposed to, to screens. Uh, one of the things we have uh, read from, uh, I think this is research in pre-COVID era, where they said the exposure of uh, blue light from our screens to children has um, an almost like drug-like effect where they they want to continue watch to watch more or to engage more obviously this uh, the best example of this is through tv where you find um, a lot of children almost become zombie like whenever they're watching um, uh, tv content and it, it, it's the same with uh, the, the same content on phone same content on on uh, uh, on tablet and, and laptop devices. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, influence that the technology makers or creators are able to, to have over this effect. Um, there's a lot of studying that needs to be done to ensure that um, there's minimal impact in terms of uh, that negative impact of technology. Um, apart from the fact that also technology needs that investment, um, it's, it, it doesn't come for free. As individuals, as parents, we have to go out of our way to invest in this technology and take care of it. Um, I was speaking to a friend of mine um, who is, is facing the same challenges we are in terms of homeschooling. They were complaining that um, the because of uh, so she has three children and she has one laptop the household has one laptop so how do you share um, three children who are who are all in primary school who are expected to be learning at the same time with the virtual classes to share one laptop so what's happened is uh, she has to give up her phone her spouse also has to give up his phone at uh, particular hours and the downside of that is that uh, because of the nature in which kids are all these devices have gotten damaged at some point you know so that's also an after effect that nobody had thought about um, sometimes you expect we might expect kids to treat these devices the way as adults we treat them but uh, because of their playful nature um, they may they may not do that so that also has a negative effect in the in the sense that they have to invest more to be able to access and consume this digital content uh, with the with the technology that that is presented to them. Um, so it's a, it's a very it's a very very trying um, period. Um, the, the, a lot of answers, a lot of questions we don't have answers to. Uh, when it comes to even, we, we may not be able to even accurately measure this impact 
of uh, technology being more ingrained in our day-to-day -day lives. We may not be able to impact that now. Probably that will happen in, in uh, we, may, we may not be able to measure that impact properly now, but in the future, we probably will be able to. Uh, but the fact is, um, I think technology is here to stay. And uh, the importance has even gone higher up in priority uh, compared to, to before. And uh, I think we, we need to acknowledge the fact that um, there's a lot of study that will need to be done on, on what this exposure to technology right now will have an impact on each of us in the next five years, in the next 10 years, in 15 years. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, insight. We appreciate, uh, uh, Alistair, you've been able to explain to us uh, uh, quite well to be able to understand, you know, what we're using technology for and what we can be able to use technology for uh, going forward. Um, uh, Christina, we'll come back to you to be able to give us a commentary on the seven habits of uh, effective uh, or con conflict competent uh, schools. So, uh, Christina, if you're ready, you can go right ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Charles, for a very detailed, you've dissected the sector. In, in very, very deeply, you've delved deep into the issues within the sector. And uh, when you look at what he has mentioned as the main challenges, he's talked of emotional drain, he's talked of psychological uh, challenges, technological challenges, physical challenges, of course, disputes and conflicts will arise as a result of that. It's not that uh, this is going to, uh, this is a cause of, of, of conflict because conflicts are there with us every day. And in situations where human beings are, they are always conflicts, always. Therefore, the question is, how do we support as mediators? How do we support the education sector to stabilize, to settle in this situation that has been very well analyzed by my brother Charles, because he's, he's touched on the side of the parents, the society, the teachers, the students. And of course, this will all impact on the implementation of the curriculum and the coverage of the syllabus which rolls over to the performance, the academic performance, especially in the examinations, the final examinations. Right now, the candidates are wondering and stressed and, and, and wondering what is going to happen, whether they will do exams this year or next year. And if they do, they, are, they, they feel inadequate, uh, inadequately mm -hmm. prepared. Therefore, at Jesilo Consultancy, we have come up with a solution or an advisory whereby we are assisting schools. Actually, I'm in conversations with uh, quite a number of principals and hand teachers, both in the public sector and the private sector. We are coming up with conversations where we are talking about how are we going to approach this. Mm -hmm. You know, it is like arriving at a new station where you have never been before. It's like, assume you're, 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 you're traveling to China, you've never been there before, and you have arrived at Beijing airport. How do you go from there? And note, no one is showing you the way. No one is there. No one is there to to, to, to welcome you with a board telling you, uh, written your name. So we are in such kind of a situation 
and that's the future we are looking at. And Jesilo Consultancy has come up with a solution to that, or rather, an advisory, a consultation whereby we can assist them through very simple methods. You would, you would agree with me that right now, what people want are practical solutions to the issues that are at hand, not just mere talk. And people want policies that are working. People want advice that is working. And straight to the point, the parents here are affected because of their children, their school going children. Those who are in school are also wondering what to do. Yes, some children may seem happy they are not going back to school, but I can assure you it's just a matter of time before they say, no, daddy, mommy, we want to go back to school. So there are all these conflicts everywhere. The education system touches everyone in different ways. So we have come up with a very simplified, uh, practical uh, way mm -hmm. of resolving conflicts in schools using alternative measures or alternative ways. And this is where I'm actually uh, uh, almost done with a book that I'm calling The Seven Habits of Conflict Competent Schools. And these habits, I'll briefly uh, mention them here. And they'll assist, they'll assist the school management in ensuring that they, are, they have put in place measures that are assisting the parents, the students, to settle down, you know, to stabilize. When we go to hospital sometimes when we are unwell, or yeah, we are unwell and you don't know exactly what is happening with you, the doctor will first stabilize you before they can diagnose the, 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 the illness. So here, the, the, this habit will assist the school management to be able to, be able to, to, to stabilize the situation at home because this is where we have emotional strain or drain that has happened. They are, they are receiving, they'll be receiving students who are emotionally drained. They'll be receiving students who are psychologically affected. They'll be receiving uh, students who are coming from parents who are also stressed. They are also physically tired of waiting. So there will be so much of that. So we are looking at uh, intra and interpersonal conflicts. And these seven habits will, will be addressing all this. Therefore, it is an advisory uh, to, or of a way of approaching uh, 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 to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 in the education sector. Now, I'll go through the seven habits, which have again broken down to the, the four habits of competent, I mean, conflict competent schools and the three habits of conflict competent management in schools and education institutions. Now, the first habit is the ability to identify or to know or to detect conflict or dispute with the students or among the students, the teachers, the management, and generally the school ecosystem. Now, how do you detect? Here we undertake a risk money, uh, I mean a risk assessment. We are able to e equip, after the risk assessment, we're able now to come up with a tool that is going to equip the school with the necessary tools to approach and deal and, and manage the, the, the effects, you know, of this kind of disputes that are rising within the sector. The second habit that we will be dealing with, or we are dealing with, is prevention. We again equip not only the, the, the management, but also the teachers who deal with uh, discipline 
that is a, the, manage, the senior management in the schools, and also the the the, the, uh, the student leaders. We also equip them with the tools to be able to prevent, to know how to prevent disputes from escalating from just a minor quarrel, a minor argument, to a major uh, 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 issue, a major dispute, which may lead to destruction of not only property, but even sometimes human life. We, we have stories all over in media in the past of schools, school assaults, uh, college uh, 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 strikes leading to destruction of property on the roads where big people's vehicles are stoned. So you see all this, we, 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 we are able to equip the, 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 the student leadership and the school management with tools and skills to assist them in preventing uh, the same. Because pre, uh, there's an old adage that says that prevention is better than cure. And therefore, going by that, then we need to know how to, what to do in order to ensure that that doesn't happen. For instance, we, in, the school, in the schools, the teachers the, and the management receive these students who are emotionally drained. How do you build? You know, how do you strengthen them? How do you, as a management, uh, uh, assist the students to stabilize and see that, well, they still have future. We still make it. We can. We'll still cover the syllabus. You'll still succeed in your examinations. So all these things we are addressing them in the seven ha uh, seven habits of conflict competence schools. The, the third habit is mitigation to mitigate. Now this is a situation. Actually, this is the level at which we are entering. When the schools now reopen, we'll be entering at the level of mitigation. COVID-19 is here. It has ravaged education to very serious and high scales of, of destruction of, destruction of the, the, the system in terms of both the implementation of uh, the curriculum and the core curriculum that I mentioned earlier. So how do we mitigate the effects mm -hmm. of all this? So this again, we equip the schools with these skills and tools and ways and insights on how to deal with that. And this is all through alternative mm -hmm. dispute resolution measures or methods. And mediation, of course, is on top of the list. There are, of course, med mediatable cases. There are cases also mm -hmm. which are not mediatable within the school setting. Therefore, all this will be able to advise uh, on the way forward, we'll be able also to advise on at what level does the school uh, go to hire other, 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 other uh, alternative dispute resolution methods? And also, when do, does the school or the management go for litigation? So uh, mitigation is the third habit. So I've talked of detection, prevention, mitigation. And uh, the fourth is resolve or resolution. So once you have identified, you've prevented, you've done all that you could in mitigating the, the effects of a, a challenge that is already there, then how do we resolve? So here is where we equip the schools again with uh, skills and, and approaches and techniques and tactics and insights on how to resolve the, 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 the challenges uh, or other disputes or conflicts that are come up in the schools. And note that uh, as we do all this, we are bringing in all the stakeholders in the school sec uh, sector, on the school setup, the parents, the students, the, the, the community around the school, the stakeholders in education. And here we are talking about the ministry, of course, at large. We are talking of the unions. Uh, we are talking of suppliers also. There are so many people who have a stake in the education system. So all this will be involved at one point or another. And it's good also to note that in uh, this, these steps or these habits, it will take time. It's a process which has to be done step by step and in order for us to get the, the, the best results. Now, 
the sixth, the sixth uh, habit of a conflict competent school, which also falls under uh, the, seven, the three habits of conflict competent management, uh, education management, is adaptation. So once now you have, once we have set up, we have assisted the school to set up the first four habits mm -hmm. and they are running smoothly, of course, under the consultation, under our consultation, then the school now is able to adapt that. And at some point, we, we just mm -hmm. leave them to proceed. And of course, it becomes a school culture. Then the seventh, the sixth, sorry, the fifth is adaptation. The sixth is management. How do you manage uh, the, the dispute landscape within the school uh, system? So here we have the, you have already identified the issues, the disputes. So how do you manage that using the tools that have been given or have been uh, acquired? And finally, the seventh habit is reviewing. You have to constantly review the dispute ecosystem, the, I mean, the, 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 the dispute environment within the school system. You keep reviewing it and uh, finding out ways and means of addressing that. So with a background knowledge of the challenges that we are about to face, and of course, with the tools, equipped with the tools to, to, to manage the situation, then I believe the education system will be in a position, uh, or rather our schools and the institutions, uh, universities, colleges, will be in a position to manage at least not to collapse, you know, or people to die of stress. Because where you're dealing with human beings, there's a lot of stress involved. But when you're equipped with the relevant tools, then it assists someone in decision making. Thank you, Sarah. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for your guidance on how we can be able to address uh, some of the anticipated. Uh, uh, conflict issues. I see um, Shafiq asks a question about, uh, you know, the way forward for education. And uh, uh, Shafiq, would you like to just uh, uh, probably say a little bit more about that? Yes. Hello? Yes, go on, Shafiq. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, Christina, um, okay, Christina, I think you got some pretty valid points. And uh, you are positioned to be in there to help the school community and the students, teachers, sort out this issue. Um, I have two questions. One, are we really prepared on the way forward in terms of the trend that the education is taking with the technology that is coming in vis-a-vis -vis what we have been doing currently in terms of memorizing most of the stuff and the students that pass are mostly those good memories rather than any know-how of how to practically implement what has been taught in the college. And secondly, in terms of, would you consider involving mediation and meditation as many of the Western countries are inculcating to be able to mentally deal with the child teacher scenario to be able to better prepare them for mediation? which is a process, which is a tool to help once the mind is clear and is able to receive information. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Christina, would you like to respond? Christina? Okay, um, yes, I think uh, Shafiq, those, those are actually very uh, valid uh, things that that you bring up eh? that we need really to be able to think about what what are we doing what can we do as mediators uh, to to support the whole uh, education system I think something else that probably we need to to think about as 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 mediators I think mediation is very much an organic process where uh, we allow those who are involved to be able to create their own solutions. So how, how much of, 
of this space are we allowing for the actual learners uh, to be able to define what they would actually like in terms of learning? Because is, is, is the learning, are the students to be taught? Must they follow the curriculum that they are given? Or can the students be given the space to, to, to sort of grow in their own curriculum and in their interests? And, and then, of course, there are questions of how does that then change the, the nature of uh, education. Uh, sorry, Christina, you had, uh, uh, I think, uh, gotten out a bit. Uh, Shafiq uh, asked some questions. Did you get Shafiq's questions? Please bring it on. Sorry? No, I didn't get it, kindly. Uh, okay, you, 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 you didn't uh, get, okay. Uh, Sh Shafiq, maybe I will just let you do a quick, uh, because Christina is back so that she may be able to respond. Okay, um, uh, Christina, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I had uh, written it down, but the, anyway, I will repeat it. The challenge right now, I think, is that your consultancy is in the right place in terms of addressing mediation. And my questions are twofold. One, is the technology that we are now using relevant in terms of the syllabus that is currently being taught, which is more geared towards memorizing and regurgitating that in an exam paper, versus research and development where you have an open paper for students to research and respond because there is a technology that is available, there is information much more than what the syllabus can offer and the second question is, would you be open to including meditation as a way of helping the students, teacher, to be mentally able to deal with issues for them to be able to be mature enough to indulge in the process of mediation? Thank you, Shafiq. Um, one, yes, technology. The technology we have is able to deal with all these issues. Though there is still a challenge. Why? Because honestly speaking and practically speaking, we have like 80% of Kenya, Kenyans, or maybe 60% uh, who are not able to access internet. And of course, it's because of the, 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 the economic background or even the geographical location. Therefore, that will be the challenge. But yes, technology is relevant and it can be useful in the education sector. Now, coming to the syllabus coverage, yes, it can be used again in the syllabus coverage, very well so. But uh, I want to agree and concur with Charles that we may not completely and effectively do away with the physical contact in the classroom. That is a teacher-student time, contact time. That is still the best. So whichever way we look at it, that would still be the best. And my comment here, can show all the schools the relevant technology resources which are going to help, especially the public schools, in, uh, in um, uh, covering the syllabus online. So those are issues that may arise. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christina. Um, I think basically what... Uh, we have been able to see uh, fr from you know the different presenters this morning is that, uh, and what we are all also acknowledging is the fact that there are actually changes within the education system, and there are changes that we will need to live with. There is greater use of technology. There are the impacts of those technology, but there are also the benefits of those technology. And I think what we are also saying is that, uh, apart from the fact that we are moving to an area where we are probably being more dependent on technology, we really cannot be able to do away with the human interface 
within the education sector or within the education um, system. So um, I think uh, we, we, all these are things for us to be able to think through as, as mediators. And uh, I think what I mentioned earlier on is that, you know, as mediators, our role is basically to facilitate the discussions when they are conflict and their issues and their changes. And so I think we also must be careful as mediators coming in, not to be coming in to give direction, but to be able to support the organic process as there are changes within the education uh, sector. Um, so I think I would like to thank everyone very much for uh, being able to be with us this morning, being able to be a part of the discussions. Uh, this morning, unless there is anybody who would like um, to make any uh, comment or have any final question, then I think we will actually be coming to a close of this particular session. Okay, so uh, Wangari, go on. Gary, you can go on. Thank you very much, uh, Mediator Sarah. I would like to really thank you for uh, this session. Uh, it has proceeded on very, very well. And uh, uh, most of all, I know I, I actually have just tweeted um, on, uh, on this particular session that this discussion is really, really so wide. Uh, Charles Kifika from Longhorn, he actually gave us a statement and said that no one really knows how this looks like. And uh, when I hear that from him, it's actually a very humbling uh, statement. It's actually a very, uh, a very, very humbling statement because the surprising thing is that, uh, you know, some, we, we actually thought that technology would, uh, would sort us out in, in every area. But what really I'm hearing is that we actually are discovering or rediscovering, you know, how else can we do, let's say, like what we need to do, whether it's in the areas of, let's say, like our work or whether it's in uh, areas that relate to uh, education. Really, the word called disruption is something that is, it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not a foreign uh, phenomenon um, anymore. Uh, something I'd like to request, I know we, as we get into the closing, is if Charles can really just highlight to us, because that word disruption kept being reverberating. That word disruption has, is not new. It kept re reverberating. So perhaps where is it that we lost this journey um, of us being able to be on time? Because I think right now what we are dealing with is not COVID. We are either dealing with our own um, lack of either moving uh, faster or not moving um, uh, efficiently or uh, as uh, I think or tied to the other side when you talk about, for instance, if I take the issue of um, laptops, if the laptop program had been um, set up, today we would be having every child having, a, um, every child would be able to be having with them at home a device. Then now we probably would be saying that the hurdles are a bit less that, um, that we are dealing with, with regard to how then internet access. Again, if I go back like to if it's internet access, I mean, I remember trenches being dug all the way to my grandmother's home. So, I mean, these trenches were being dug so that internet can be there for, you know, every Kenyan. So how is it that we, we have, or where did we lose this game if we say that the technology and uh, the access to devices, the access to the internet is supposed to have been um, the game changer? for um, our education system. Uh, from uh, Christina, I'd probably just uh, inquire, as I say, uh, congratulations. And uh, as Osliana, we are really, really delighted to uh, be part of um, your uh, moving forth with the development of the seven habits uh, for, of, of, uh, for the highly effective schools in regard to the area of conflict competence. That is a game changer. And really, congratulations, Mediator Christina. Just from, I think this is a time when mediators are on the call, you just send they, on your chat, they, we, can, we can all be able to just send, you know, a clap. I mean, I'm really, I'm waiting for those claps. When you go, is it to your, yeah, just go to your chat. I'm already seeing the claps. Really mediators, 
it, it, it is a step in the right direction. We must be the ones to give the way forward, not only in the area of education. And that's why I'm really, really delighted because uh, for us, uh, Christina was keen on the area of education. And so, you know, we do what it takes. So if there's an area that you're very keen on as a mediator, that's why Wasilian Hub exists. Our work is to move, shape the universe so that as a community, we are causing the professional practice of mediation to be well practiced and also to be understood. So congratulations again, mediator Christina, and uh, really, really are delighted. As I do get uh, to uh, wrap on my on 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 um, on this list on on my on my um, interlude, I would like to commend the team that is behind um, our 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 symposium. Uh, we have uh, mediator Sarah Ter, whom you can actually see uh, as is now. Um, she's the one who's been holding this session as a part of my um, uh, moderating team. We have mediator Amanda. Amanda has been really on top of uh, making, uh, making sure we're invited, reminding us, and also she'll be moderating some of the sessions. Uh, mediator Mohammed, who's uh, engaged also with regards to rapporteuring, and also young mediator uh, Lily uh, Maina and Jerry, who is engaged also in uh, rapporteuring. Yet again, I say thank you and congratulations, uh, mediators. Thank you for joining us in this great celebration. As Wasiliana Hub, we are celebrating three years in the tech justice innovation with uh, this quarter one virtual series of uh, mediation day on uh, the 28th May, 2020. We have sessions all through the day. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking forward to see you there so that we can go forth to enrich lives. Thank you very much and God bless you. Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wangari. And uh, I, I, I think uh, that really will be the end of this uh, particular session uh, that we have been looking at uh, education. Um, the next session begins at uh, 10 o'clock and we'll be looking at uh, the issue of uh, the employment and labor issues. So I encourage all of you to come back and uh, join us for that particular session. Uh, yes, Pongari will just be sharing uh, briefly. Yes, we have the employer employee relations in Kenya. Uh, the session will be beginning at uh, 10 o'clock. Um, so I think. Um, Okay, so Shafiq says that uh, he missed uh, a part of the IA session, so we'll be able to see uh, about that. Uh, so I think we, we are done for this particular session. We can have a break. Some of you probably came in a bit earlier. We really appreciate everything. Uh, thank you everyone for your contribution. Uh, thank you everyone for your uh, discussion. Um, we shall conclude this particular session with the national anthem once again, and then we shall be able to leave at uh, pleasure. Oh God of all creation, bless this land and nation. Justice be a shield and a defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Let it be found within our borders. Okay, Asante Sana, uh, you're free to leave as you will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sana.